And since he plays a role in this movie, let's talk about Sean Bean, the only actor I know who dies in every single movie he's been in. I know, it appears he survives some of the films he's in, like Pixels, National Treasure, or Jupiter Ascending. But that's when the Bean Brothers theory comes into play. I think it's clear that Sean has a twin brother, most likely named Dean, who takes work Sean doesn't want. Therefore, all the crappy scripts that Sean gets go to Dean, who is allowed to use his brother's name to help him get work. See, Sean's a nice guy with one simple wish, to die in every single movie he's in. So does GoldenEye star Sean or Dean Bean? The movie doesn't take long to answer that question. Four, three, two. For England, James! <laughs> This is clearly Sean. Pierce Brosnan first met the Bond producers on the set of For Your Eyes Only, where his wife, Cassandra Harris, played Bond girl, Liesel. It was a very amusing performance between you and the uh, owner of this. Producer Albert R. Broccoli very quickly felt he'd be perfect for the role of James Bond. The decision was made that once Moore finished his run, Brosnan would take the mantle. In the erstwhile, Brosnan got offered a starring role in the TV series Remington Steel. Then the stars seemed to align. In 1987, Remington Steel was canceled, just in time for Brosnan to star in The Living Daylights at the last minute. But when word of this leaked, it generated a resurgence of interest in the show, causing it to get renewed post-cancellation. NBC contacted the producers of Bond to work out a schedule that would allow Brosnan to play both Bond and Remington Steel. Albert Broccoli would have none of it. He told NBC that James Bond will not be Remington Steel and Remington Steele will not be James Bond. Because he was still contracted for the show, Brosnan had no choice but to decline the role of James Bond, allowing Timothy Dalton to take the mantle for The Living Daylights and License to Kill. To add insult to injury, NBC only produced six more episodes of Remington Steel before canceling it again. It seemed as though Brosnan missed his chance at the legendary role. Of course, Brosnan would get another chance. After the financial debacle that was licensed to kill, the James Bond franchise went on hiatus long enough for Timothy Dalton's contract to expire. Sadly, during this hiatus, Brosnan's and Bond's life mirrored each other in one of the worst ways possible when Cassandra Harris died. She died of cancer after 11 years of marriage. But eventually, James Bond returned to theaters with Pierce Brosnan in the role on GoldenEye. Since they were out of James Bond books, they again chose to develop an original story for the spy. GoldenEye's name was taken from a contingency plan that Ian Fleming developed in case of a Nazi invasion of Gibraltar. It was also a Jamaican estate that Fleming named. A major misconception with GoldenEye is that many believe it to be a reboot, when most evidence points to it being a continuation. The only piece of evidence that's a reboot is the beginning. It takes place in 1986, assuming that GoldenEye takes place the year it was released. This means the opening to the movie takes place between the Roger Moore and Timothy Dalton heirs. But there's much more evidence to suggest that this is the continuing adventures of the same Bond we've seen the whole time. At the beginning of the movie, we see Bond regaining his license that he lost in License to Kill. In Die Another Day, Brosnan's Bond knows instantly how the knife shoe and jetpack work which indicates that Brosnan's Bond and Connery's Bond are one in the same. Also, we have the same actor playing Q. So if you want to think of this as a reboot, you really can, since the key story elements are all original. Walther PPK, 765 millimeter. Only three men I know use such a gun. I believe I've killed two of them. Lucky me. But this is very much a continuation of the Bond we've seen since the beginning. But I think I've gone on plenty of tangents. Time to talk about the elements of this movie that don't work quite so well. A pen. This is a class four grenade. Three clicks. Arms the four second fuse. Another three disarms it. The rules for the pen are clearly established, or are they? And this is all very important because I like the idea of the pen that could explode at any moment with Boris's fiddling. I'm watching it with no clue at what point the pen is at. 
Will it explode now? No, the fuse isn't supposed to be that long. I'm not saying they need to make sure we follow it perfectly without rewatching the scene, but I think I should be able to rewatch the scene and follow it exactly. And I simply can't. I'm just left hoping Bond can follow it because the audience can't at all. Don't say it. The writing's on the wall. I suppose that depends on what kind of weapon you're talking about disarming. So after Bond and Natalia escape from the Russians and learn the possible location of Goldeneye, they do what anybody would do. This is of course have sex and go on an apparent beach vacation for some reason. And together they have some clumsy exposition probing Bond's psychology that all comes completely out of left field. How many hours have these two known each other? So, pretty much when 006 shows up and, uh, oh crap, hey, wait a minute, he's alive. That means this movie stars Dean Bean. Anyways, the movie goes from being easily the best Bond movie yet to a disjointed Bond movie with some great stuff. Quickly, the movie falls victim to the classic Bond trope of having the bad guy try to kill Bond in some overly elaborate death. Only this whole plan of a vehicle that shoots itself down with missiles is utterly bizarre. Can you imagine how expensive it would be to set this up? It makes the laser scene in Goldfinger look downright practical. I thought 006 knew James Bond. Surely he'd see the wisdom in just outright killing him. You just don't get it, do you? You don't. After Bond, of course, escapes his overly complex death, he is recaptured, this time by the Russians and more specifically by Mishkin. Mishkin wants to know who among their rank is working for Janice, and he obviously suspects Omarov because he's very quick to believe Bond. Defense Minister! I must protest! This is my investigation. You are out of order. From what I'm hearing, it is you who's out of order. But he just lets Omarov come into the room and start messing with the whole interrogation to the point where he kills everyone in the room except for Bond and Natalia, probably because they have much stronger contracts. Mishkin is an example of an all too common character in movies, a character that is completely and utterly pointless. I'm not sure if he had a point and it was written away, or if the writer had an idea of what to do with his character and dropped it, or if it was edited out, or if it's just sloppy writing. But what you end up with is a character that contributes nothing to your movie. It's simply a waste of time to include him and a waste of the audience's time to watch him. Maybe it's to show that Omarov is desperate, but considering how much longer his character lasts, it doesn't seem worth the time to establish that. When doing a driving test to regain his license to kill, Bond ends up driving like a madman in a flirtatious drive with Xenia. Of course, he fails to test because he scared the crap out of the driving instructor by driving like a madman. James, you're incorrigible. What am I going to do with you? Well, let's toast your evaluation, shall we? Oh, oh no, wait. He passes it because he uses the James Bond seduction technique of being James Bond. Seriously, he just decides to hook up with her, and she goes for it. Would Bond have tried the same trick if the instructor was male? Shit, knowing Bond's rep, why weren't all the testers he encountered male? Shit, just imagine this scene if Robinson was the tester. Let's toast your evaluation, shall we? Also, what is the moral with this scene? Hey, if you scare the crap out of a girl, just seduce her, and all will be right as rain. No, that just doesn't work. Nothing. There is nothing here. Let's make another pass. 
Do you realize all the bad guys had to do to win the day in this movie is ignore Bond? That's it. Bond had escaped from their clutches, but only had an idea about where the golden eye was. But it was so well hidden that Bond and Natalia were giving up hope of finding it. Maybe Wade was right. There's no dish. So how do they find it? Do they use some detective skills? Perhaps a misspoken word from Trevelyan that Bond recalls. Or an old code from Boris that Natalia remembers. Nope. Instead the bad guys shoot a missile at Bond and Natalia. All they had to do was let them pass. The satellite was well hidden. There is no reason to believe they were going to be found. Anyone interested in hiding their location should know if you're hidden, you just sit tight and let the people poking around pass. That's the point of hiding. I guess plan B could always be shoot a missile that doesn't kill your target and send a loose cannon insane assassin after the survivors because that plan has no flaws whatsoever. Shows did enjoy a good squeeze. I've never had a particularly high opinion of this Bond film. Don't get me wrong, I always thought it was entertaining, just not as great as everyone else. But until my recent viewing, I didn't understand the disparity. Now I think I understand it quite well. The beginning of this movie is fantastic. We get reintroduced to Bond, while also being introduced to this new Bond, who happens to be my favorite Bond, Pierce Brosnan. I feel he covers the full spectrum of past Bonds in his performance, carrying Connery's sass, Moore's wit, Lazenby's emotion, and Dalton's edge, all rolled up into one fully realized character. It's just too bad his movies weren't better written, but that's certainly not this film's fault. We also see that this Bond has a past history we don't know, but given the long hiatus, it makes sense to develop mostly new characters, rather than risk alienating the new fans with obscure characters. We see one of the best Bond henchmen and Bond girls with Xenia, who has a very flirtatious relationship with James Bond. By the way, her thing is crushing men with her thighs while in bed, which leads us to a great sex turn to fight scene between the two. It also provides some fan service to people who watch the past movies without getting the new people too bogged down. Yuna Yarkov, assassination methods, strangulation with hands or thighs. Well, James, she's just your type. Really, this movie has some of my all-time favorite Bond villains. I already talked about Xenia, but we also get Boris, the obnoxious computer programmer played by Alan Cumming, who is just so annoying that you just can't wait for that smirk to get wiped off his face. Yes! I am invincible! Then you have Dean Bean, who really does a great job as 006. We can clearly see how he gets under Bond's skin when Bond decides to drop him to his death and... Oh, 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 holy shit. This is actually Sean Bean. I got that completely wrong. Sorry about that. Oh, oh, he survived that? Wow. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so this is Dean Bean. Anyways, Dean really shines here, and holy crap, he dies three times in this movie. This is the most Sean Beaniest movie I've ever seen. Anyways, General Omarov is the only villain that doesn't really stand out, but he serves his purpose nicely. The Bond song this time is Goldeneye by Tina Turner, written by Bono and the Edge of U2. This is one of my all-time favorite Bond songs. It has the Bond theme woven through it perfectly, and despite the fact that it wasn't written by Turner, it sounds exactly like what a Tina Turner Bond song should sound like. The first half of this movie is great. Right up there of Casino Royale is some of the best Bond on feature film. But the second half isn't nearly as strong. So how much is the first half weighed down by the second? I'd say not much. There's still plenty of stuff in the second half that's awesome, it's just not as well put together. Still, I'd give this film a 9 out of 10 and consider it the second best Bond film I've reviewed so far. At this point, I have to consider Marlon Campbell my all-time favorite Bond director. And if Sam Mendes drops out and Craig decides to do only one more Bond movie after Spectre, which the rumor is he's contracted for, I hope they get Campbell back to finish out the Craig franchise. Just changing carriages. 